Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Lena. Um, I am just delighted to be here. Uh, Toronto, full disclosure, Toronto is my hometown. Uh, to come back to Toronto is a wonderful thing. I left here when I was 17. Now, can I ask um, you, uh, who would be from media in the eastern side of Toronto? Uh, how about central? Would you declare yourself central? Okay, good. And how about from the west uh, side of Toronto? All right, good. And from the western, anybody from Etobicoke here? Very good. That's, uh, that's my hometown. Uh, I actually had the opportunity. I, flew, I got to fly myself in. I'm still an active pilot and flew our little team in uh, and on short approach into onto runway 23 at Pearson. I just had to look down out of the window and see the little house my mom and dad bought in Etobicoke in 1955 and my 92-year-old mother just moved out of last year. So I've always cheered for Toronto. Toronto teams are my teams. None of my boys have lived in Toronto and yet they're all doomed to cheer for Toronto teams. Uh, the Toronto uh, that I left uh, is not exactly the Toronto I come back to. It's far more advanced. It's upscale, it's cosmopolitan, it's fantastic. Um, th what's so important about having the opportunity to speak to you today uh, is that uh, we want to make sure uh, that those who come and make Canada and Toronto such a rich part of this nation are well aware of what defense means to you, that we in uniform uh, are defending those things that you're interested in. Uh, we're very interested that uh, you comment and are part of the discussion on defense, uh, see yourself invested in defense, and of course hope that some of you or those you influence your children, your nieces, uh, your nephews uh, may consider a career in the Canadian military. More and more people are. So thank you very much for joining me here. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit before we get to some questions about who we are, about what we do, and about how we do it. So in general terms, uh, national defense is the largest federal department in Canada, both in terms of budget and people. Uh, it includes 92,000 full-time employees, 67,000 of those are like me, in uniform every day, 24,000 public servants in Ottawa but spread out across uh, the nation. We have 28,000 reservists who are part-time military, we have 5,000 rangers spread across dozens of communities uh, in the north. Uh, our military communities are, are quite truly woven into the very fabric of this nation, from alert in the high Arctic uh, to St. John's in Newfoundland, out to uh, where my, one of my sons is, out in Esquimalt, BC, and of course, right here in Toronto. And to support the important work of, those, uh, of these communities and our personnel on missions abroad, National Defense, as you would expect, acquires and maintains a wide range of equipment, trucks, aircraft, ships, and we own an immense amount of infrastructure across Canada. I have 21,000 buildings, some numbers of those thousands I would like not to own, and they, they need something done to them, but many of them are key to housing the things that we have. We have two and a quarter million hectares of land across the country, 5,500 kilometers of road that we clear of snow and make sure is very well maintained. So what do we do with all that? Well, let's kind of divide up where our activities are largely uh, divided. Domestically, the men and women, you have to understand, of the Canadian Armed Forces, when they put on this uniform, are on call 24-7 for 365 days a year to respond. Uh, to crises across Canada as the government calls. Our highest priority is the defense against threats to our domestic security. So this means patrolling and surveying the air approaches to the nation, the sea approaches, uh, approaches to the nation, and our one border, land border. It means uh, safeguarding cavern, uh, Canada's sovereignty and protecting against illegal activity. It also means helping civil authorities against disaster relief, including flood and hurricane response, and providing security assistance for large hosting events, as you saw in 2010 with the Olympics in Vancouver, uh, the G8, G20 here in Toronto. It also means 
uh, responding as first responders for search and rescue in collaboration with other organizations and levels of government. A lot of Canadians at the age of 65 now are as fit as Canadians uh, of previous generations at 45, and a lot of them are finding a lot of spare time on their hands. They're climbing the tallest mountains and uh, going into some of the deepest and harshest territory across Canada, and occasionally they fall out of their boats and fall off of those mountains. That's in addition uh, to the very key jobs carried out by our fishermen on either coast and those who are patrolling our nation. So last year there were more than 9,000 search and rescue incidents in Canada coordinated by the Canadian Armed Forces. Canadian Armed Forces tasked people out in response to 1,000 of those operations, saving the lives of many of those individuals who found themselves tethered to that last response. We also deployed troops in, at the request of civil authorities during the crippling floods that swept across Alberta last summer, Ontario, northern Ontario in May, and most recently in July in Manitoba. Uh, and in those cases, we uh, provide support to critical infrastructure, we secure property, and most importantly, we airlift the most threatened of Canadians to safety. And every winter, uh, we help Parks Canada by taking some of our uh, artillery pieces into Rogers Pass and clearing out the snow, making sure that the lines of communication are there for over 4,000 vehicles and trains each day. And that's critical, critical trade goods. So in all these ways and more, we, we help keep Canada safe for, for Canadians. And as underscored by the name of our defense policy, which is Canada First Defense Strategy, our number one priority, make no doubt about it, will always be the defense of Canadians on home turf. But of course, Canada is an international player. We've rarely been isolationist in this nation. More and more Canadians were not born in this nation. So we have family and friends abroad. We vacation, we do business in other countries. We're increasingly globalized in our approach. It's an interconnected world. Events everywhere can very quickly impact our security here at home. So the Canadian Armed Forces have a role in playing, uh, to play in defending North America, certainly, but also in contributing to international peace and security. We do it in many ways, certainly through disaster relief and uh, humanitarian assistance, but we also help train and build the capacities of partner nations, the militaries of partner nations. We carry, carry out operations against terrorists, uh, counter-narcotic organizations, peace support organizations, and ultimately, and only where necessary, combat operations. So you will know about the recent uh, Afghanistan mission, our biggest such deployment since the Second World War. 40,000 Canadian soldiers served in very harsh and challenging conditions. Many were wounded. Ultimately, 158 Canadians laid down their lives. But it's key to recognize that for over 12 years, the Canadian forces worked as part of an international coalition that included 60 nations to root out insurgents and to attempt to create the conditions for peace and security. Now, although the people of Afghanistan continue to face challenges, and they will, some tremendous progress has been made in that nation. Canada helped construct many of the roads that are used for trade now. They connected communities to the electrical grids they vaccinated and enabled children to attend school. Our forces just plainly helped create the conditions for reconstruction and development to occur and to strengthen the Afghan security forces who are now providing security for that country. We came out of Afghanistan in March of this year very quietly as that mission uh, is coming to an end uh, later months. Today, the Canadian Armed Forces are still active in more than a dozen locations around the world. Through the North American Aerospace Defense Command headquartered in Colorado, where I was just the deputy commander of NORAD before I came to this job, we contribute to the defense of continental aerospace. More generally, through the United Nations, through the North Atlantic, North Atlantic Treaty Organization and multinational force and observers, we participate in stabilization efforts, observer efforts, and capacity building missions in places like Haiti, the Democratic uh, uh, Republic of Congo, Sudan, Kosovo, the Golan Heights, Egypt, and Cyprus, while also taking part in multinational operations to counter trafficking and terrorism 
in the Mediterranean Sea, where right now we've got a ship that has just recently transited into the Black Sea, uh, the Arabian Sea, the Eastern Pacific Ocean, and the Caribbean Sea, where in March of this year, HMCS Glace Bay was in on a bust that recovered 2,400 kilograms of cocaine, and that's just one of the most recent of very many operations like that. Furthermore, we stand by and ready on alert to provide assistance where requirement for national disaster relief abroad. You see frequently in the news our disaster assistance response team, uh, very appropriately called the DART. It's designed to deliver rapid emergency relief such as primary medical care, uh, safe drinking water and engineering assistance for up to 40 days until uh, other uh, aid agencies, international aid agencies can come to assistance. Now, you saw the DART deployed last year in support of international operations in the Philippines. It's remarkable. It's on the other side of the world, and we were there within days. One of the first international uh, assisters in place, uh, Typhoon Haiyan, had killed 5,000 people, displaced millions. Canadian troops were there, as I say, within days, clearing roads, reconnecting communities to the power grid. We purified an ocean of water, 500,000 liters of water, treated over 6,500 medical patients and delivered in the month we were there over 300,000 pounds of food and supplies and building materials. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree with me the world is an unpredictable place. Of course, in addition to natural disasters like Typhoon Haiyan, conflicts of political origin can and do break out from time to time in recent months far more uh, frequently than we would like sometimes with very little warning and often with devastating consequences. We've seen this a few years ago in Libya, a couple of years ago and continuing through today in Syria, and of course even more recently in Ukraine and Iraq. In those two countries in, particularly, this, uh, in particular, the security situation has deteriorated rapidly. So at the request of our government, the Canadian Armed Forces are supporting multilateral efforts to find solutions and protect civilians in those nations. For example, we're contributing personnel to the deterrence and the monitoring efforts to the west of Ukraine in Central and Eastern European countries as part of NATO's uh, reassurance measures. We're airlifting military supplies from donor nations into Iraq uh, to uh, aid Iraqi security forces in the north against this fanatic and heinous organization, the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant, or ISIL. Uh, and um, uh, it is uh, been seen to be an organization that is into wanton murder and displacing Iraqis regularly. So how do we do it? Let's finish up with that. The unpredictable and multiple and concurrent demands on the Canadian Armed Forces really is our business. That's exciting to us. It means that we must maintain a high degree of flexibility and, and the ability to respond quickly and effectively and multilaterally. We refer to this generally as developing readiness, and we dump a lot of effort into generating readiness. Parts of creating readiness is ensuring that our personnel have the right tools to do their jobs, and you'll know the Canada First Defense Strategy, which is uh, the strategy we go by right now, uh, is, uh, it outlines very well the largest recapitalization we've seen since the 1950s, basically replacing all of our naval gear, all of our army gear, all of our Air Force gear. And we're mindful that we've got to manage your taxpayers' dollars, our taxpayers' dollars uh, frugally. We've implemented all kinds of steps, the defense renewal team, uh, the new defense procurement strategy uh, to that end. As chief of defense staff, though, I must emphasize that our greatest assets aren't those pieces of equipment. Our greatest asset is our people. They're the ones wearing the uniforms. They're the ones using the equipment. With people comes hope. They make the decisions on the ground, the key decisions that make their actions effective. Now, these remarkable individuals come from all backgrounds. Some hail from rural communities. Some, like me, are from right here in a big city like Toronto. But our young men in uniform reflect the strength of our great nation, and it's found in its diversity. Now, a key factor in creating readiness is, is placing these recruits where they can best use their unique skills uh, and preparing and then supporting them properly so they can deploy as we've looked at whenever and wherever they're needed. Now, the Canadian Armed Forces 
uh, and I hope this interests you, offers a huge variety of opportunities, over 100 different career paths to be exact. We have a pilot in front of you. We have a public affairs officer to the right of you. We have everything from vehicle, aviation, electronics, technicians. We have dentists. We have doctors, engineers, and cooks. We even have musicians. Got to be a pretty good musician to be in one of our bands, uh, but we have musicians. Getting everyone trained, that's a massive task. To accomplish it, we have schools across Canada where our members receive their specialized training uh, for these various careers. That includes undergraduates and master's degrees for a very small number, even PhD study. It includes this very school we're in this morning, the Canadian Forces College, which I love. It's a beachhead in Toronto. It prepares our senior officers for the strategic uh, responsibilities that they'll take on when they leave this institution. We view continuing education uh, as a responsibility to our people who are going to be making life and death decisions uh, wherever uh, they're in a complex operating environment. But we also see it as an investment for all Canadians who will count on our people uh, to act with integrity and skill. Of course, it's not, it's not enough just to prepare your people for their missions. It's also our duty to care for them and for their families. And you've read a fair bit about this in recent years. In a country where military service is not obligatory, where it's a choice, these men and women have chosen to put country before self, quite fundamentally, and have accepted from time to time very real risks on behalf of their fellow Canadians. That's why we strive to provide them really comprehensive support services, such as physical and mental health care, emergency child care and family programming, and very specialized benefits for those who have become ill or injured as a result of their duty uh, in the military. Canadians and the Canadian press really have been, been very uh, supportive and effective in bringing those issues uh, to the knowledge of Canadians. I'd like to thank you for that. Uh, it means a lot to us. In conclusion, what I was looking to do today is give you a bit of a sense of who we are, uh, what we look like, and, and how we prepare ourselves for those things that we do. Uh, I would encourage you to remember whenever you see someone in uniform that although you may not know their name, they're already committed to defending you with duty, with loyalty, with integrity, and with courage, uh, and if need be, to sacrifice uh, their life in defense of you, defense of Canada, in defense of Canadian interests, much as forefathers for them have been for many years. Um, we have some time. I think we've got uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, for, for some questions. Uh, I'd be delighted to, uh, to take any you may have. In the world field for one time. Uh, and the second question is, how long? Uh, how long a uh, soldier will stay in the mission or war field for one period of time? I see. Okay, good. So in, in the uh, second case, uh, we aim to rotate people out of a, uh, an area of operations within six months. Um, in recent, in the last years uh, in Afghanistan, where it was less of a combat mission and more of a training mission, we saw more uh, in theater for nine months to a maximum of a year. Uh, there is a, 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 a grouping of um, research that suggests that this is the best way to balance the needs of the nation with the health of the soldiers. But back to your original point, and that is, when do we feel that our soldiers, and we'll include in that our sailors and our aviators as well, when are they ready to head off on operations? Very interesting. Uh, various uh, trades take longer or shorter. We can have infantry trained up uh, and through our most significant training, which includes things like not only learning how to target and fight, but also a road to mental readiness in preparation to deploy within a couple of years of them joining the Canadian Armed Forces fairly quickly. Uh, however, if your niece or nephew joins up to fly a fighter aircraft, uh, he or she will likely find themselves uh, in uniform for four, five, six, seven years before they find themselves employing uh, kinetic weaponry wherever they're going to go. We always take a look at the risk of any mission, and if the risks are low and we need people with muscles and capability uh, to help out in a humanitarian way, we can cut that time directly. Uh, I took your question to be 
uh, the beefiest of the environments and the most challenging of the environments that we may have to work in, and that can be a, a much longer period of time. We never will send one of our soldiers, sailors, or aviators into a theater without completely mitigating the risks of sending them there. Thank you. Yes, Mohamed Taj Dolati from Salam Toronto uh, magazine. Uh, usually, the army is the job of the men in the world, you know, in the in the public opinion of the men. I would like to ask you how many percentage of the women there are in the different section of the Canadian Army? Yes, I think we're at uh, just under 20%. Is that right, Chief? Yeah, 15 to 20% 15 to overall. Uh, and it, it's, it's interesting. Canada was one of the first nations to open all trades. Uh, many open logistics and um, uh, support trades to women. Uh, we welcome women onto our submarines, into our fighter jets. Uh, basically, we do not see gender in the Canadian Armed Forces. Having said that, um, we find that uh, against uh, our expectations and our offers, uh, genders will self-identify which things they're interested in. Uh, so we do find higher and lower ratios across some of those trades. Uh, but generally, 15 to 20 percent uh, of all of our reg force and reserve positions are filled by women. Uh, yes, uh, my name is William Doyle Marshall, and we thank you for your update. And uh, you touched on something that I did have in mind, and we're gonna, I'm going to piggyback on it. It has to do with security in Ukraine and uh, Syria. And bearing in mind that Canada has decided to withdraw its troops out of Iraq, what are your colleagues saying? How are they feeling? Did we move out of there too soon? Should we have been there still? Or what's the general consensus? Uh, so the first part, of, sorry, the last part of your question actually refers to how are our coalition nations feeling about Canada having come out of, first of all, the combat mission three years ago, uh, and then out of the mission entirely in, uh, in March of this year. Uh, Canada played such a fundamental combat role uh, that uh, it would be fair to say that not only was Canada admired uh, for their willingness to take on such a role, but also the skill with which we did so. Uh, we were a, a, a tremendous partner uh, with so many other nations that admire our skills that I think uh, that our decision to move into the training realm ahead of some other nations uh, was seen as, a, as, a, uh, as an excellent move. And for several years, we became key in that role, kind of on the leading edge of uh, bringing the Afghan National Security Forces to where they needed to be. As you'll be aware, uh, that mission is wrapping up now. Um, the numbers for uh, the remaining support to the Afghan National Security Forces is in discussion right now. Canada won't be part of that. But Canada continually proves itself to be a great supporter of NATO missions. You'll think back to just about every NATO mission, Canada has been along and often in the lead. So Canada is, a, uh, is an activist nation in which uh, Canadian interests are seen to be interconnected internationally. Uh, and therefore, uh, as we uh, are uh, heavily employed in support of uh, reassurance measures, and they're very quickly employed in support of uh, uh, Kurdish uh, forces, uh, and, uh, and more generally, Iraqi forces, I think we're seen to be a very good partner to the coalitions that we are part of. Um, um, Janusz Niemczyk, I'm from Polish Messenger, uh, Goniec, and I have a question referring to common issues uh, of Ukraine, uh, Arctic, and the uh, purchase of F-35. Uh, what are the common issues? Uh, the NATO obviously was not prepared of having civilians uh, dressed up as civilians, well-trained uh, well civilians uh, fighting on the side of the Russian uh, uh, guerrilla, and, uh, and the Western world was not prepared for that. Second thing is uh, we have Arctic, which we, where we, uh, one day we uh, have, may have um, native people that are, um, voting for uh, joining uh, to De Denmark or Russia, and we have purchase of F-35. Uh, there is a shortfall of what those F-35 have. And you were, uh, uh, I, according to media, you were the volunteer or you, you were kind to purchase of F-35 versus having F-16s, F-16s, 
18th, uh, the shortfall of those F-35 is short distance flying versus, say, F-32. Um, 22. Uh, what would you say about our defense in case unpredictable that we would have the situation uh, in Arctic as the Ukraine have right, right now? Well, thank you very much. That, uh, that's such an interesting question. You have my head spinning, so I'm going to kind of divide it up a little bit. Um, uh, regarding the fighter aircraft, and I was in Toronto some years ago after the government had made a decision um, that they've now put uh, to reconsideration regarding the F-35. Um, what I'll say on that is I'm confident that as this process comes to a close in coming months, that Canada will be provided in the by 2020, early 2020s uh, with a very capable fighter that will be able to carry out in a far better way than the CF-18 uh, by that time will be able to all of those missions that we require from a fighter. Um, it's interesting that some of those missions will be in the Arctic, so let's take that part of your question now as well. Uh, you posed an interesting uh, theory uh, regarding uh, Native Canadians, and I have not heard that posed. Of course, that's well out of my area. What is in my area is that uh, Canada has asked its military to ensure that everyone with any ability to operate in the Arctic has either developed a primary or a secondary role uh, that supports Canadian sovereignty. So uh, most recently, the Prime Minister was up with our forces in, on Operation Nanook, uh, which is our largest exercise this year. It was uh, in, uh, near Iqaluit, uh, last year out in Yellowknife and up in Joa Haven. Um, operating the Arctic is difficult for any nation. Canada does it with extremely high capability. Deploying into the Arctic is almost as difficult to deploying internationally for us. It's a very harsh climate, uh, and to do it in the wintertime is almost prohibitive. I think uh, what, is, uh, what, is, uh, what is of great interest and needs to be recognized is the Canadian military has operated in the Arctic for decades. It's nothing new to us. Our new equipment has been purchased with the ability to continue to support Canadian interests in the north. You uh, bring up, and if you you've tied your question to this new type of warfare that, uh, that the Russians have been using uh, effectively in the Ukraine, and that's uh, called hybrid warfare, where in fact uh, Russian speakers uh, and those who may not be tied directly to Russian regulars show up in a nation to destabilize that nation. Just based on nationality, ethnicity, and language, that's a very interesting uh, way of uh, destabilizing nations and reaching goals. It has our key attention, uh, and of course, NATO being a, a, a coalition of 28 nations that must agree on the way ahead has a much slower decision loop. However, it's a formidable alliance, and what Russia sees now is somewhat slowly, perhaps more slowly than some people would like, we see the resolve of NATO now moving more troops, ships, and more aircraft close to those nations that are part of NATO to say, to give some very clear messages uh, to, uh, to Russian leaders. Of affordability, effectiveness, and, uh, and capabilities and readiness and uh, be announced by the government uh, probably before Christmas. Uh, General Andrei Mazuruk from uh, local Russian media. <laughs> Oh, which good. is very important these times, dividing local and Russian. <laughs> uh, we have TV and newspaper. And going back to Ukraine, obviously, uh, a little bit of a two-tiered question. First, can you give a little bit more detail on Canadian participation in NATO deterrent mission? And what is your professional opinion of modern state of Russian military, including its nuclear capacity? Hmm, good. Um, so when we were in Romania, we were working very closely with the uh, Romanian fighter forces uh, there, their MiG-21s. Uh, for the period we were there, um, it, it was quite clearly a presence uh, that would be recognized uh, by Russia. Um, as a result, when you work with NATO partners, there are tremendous other things that come as a result. I was speaking to my, uh, my counterpart from Romania when we were at the summit just last week. Uh, he said that in terms of air operations in NATO, they learned more in three months than they had in the previous 10 years. Uh, so really what you do is you build and share operational tactical uh, expertise and operational expertise while the more strategic part, and that is presence, is noticed and uh, taken into consideration um, by others. 
um, Russia and its military capabilities? Well, I think we have to recognize that in the last 10 years, while we've seen NATO budgets uh, for most nations come down in terms of 15 and 20 percent in general, we've seen a doubling of the Russian uh, military budget uh, for defense. Uh, we see more flights towards the Canadian and American uh, air defense identification zones up in the north. Uh, and we see uh, numbers on the ground and capabilities uh, that uh, have been dormant in Russia for some time. This, of course, is of great concern. Um, my counterpart in Russia, Valery Gerasimov, uh, was becoming a great friend. Uh, he and I were together in uh, Greenland uh, just a year and a bit ago, uh, talking about our common interests to do a search and rescue in the Arctic. Uh, I have no doubt uh, that uh, our common military culture says we have much more in common than against each other, uh, but he's under specific orders uh, to be carrying out operations uh, that he is well funded to do. So I think it's a formidable, could be a formidable threat. Uh, I have every hope uh, that, uh, uh, that as Canada continues, it's not just a military response to Russia, as you know, it's an economic response and it is one that involves a good Canadian diplomacy and, uh, and uh, the military is a, is a last resort. Well, we're saying very important things uh, with our presence uh, in the Eastern European nations. In fact, much more important discussions are going on uh, right now. Good morning, General. Thank you very much for here, hearing us here. On, um, my name is Ruiki Castelvi from Manila Times. On behalf of the Filipino people and the government of the Philippines, I would like to thank you from my heart. Now, my question to you directly, could you consider one of us to be covering your missions abroad? To covering the missions abroad? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for that comment. Um, and, and, you know, in, in talking about this last question here, uh, when we have very strategic things to do, like very quickly get into theater, uh, into theater, uh, to uh, the Philippines and help uh, those who are in a dire strait as a result of the operation. Other things happen. We develop a great fondness. Uh, you probably saw the shot as Canada was departing on top of one of the roofs of one of the homes that survived. It said, thank you, Canada. There are bonds that are created that I think we'll probably uh, see uh, an influx of more Filipinos into Canada in coming years, uh, as we've seen in recent years, which has been a fantastic bolstering to a very rich fabric here in Canada. You perhaps being one of those, sir. Um, I, I think that we have uh, done a very effective job in recent years, especially during our time in Afghanistan, in ensuring that the press were not only nearby to cover uh, our activities, but in fact were embedded. Uh, we may have occasionally gone too far and we ha may have added to uh, those things that we see in soldiers, um, the uh, stress uh, disorders that uh, come with soldiers are being seen by some press. But we will make every effort to make sure that press have direct access to those who are fundamentally involved in the operations going ahead. We recognize that the only way we can continue to have the support of Canadians back home is to make sure that clear, unadulterated message comes back from those they trust uh, and those, many of those uh, from your uh, societies and, and the groups and your readers, uh, you represent those individuals. So we will continue to do that. I would like a photo, wouldn't I? Okay. And I understand we will be making those photos available to everyone in the room? Okay, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you.